Hello, uh, my name is Amy Langenberg. I am a uh, associate professor at Eckerd College in Florida. I teach religious studies. As far as my uh, training as a scholar in Buddhist studies, I'm trained as a textual scholar and I work in Indic languages and sometimes in Tibetan. I don't read any Chinese. I have Stephanie for that. Um, I'm interested in gender and sexuality in pre-modern Indian Buddhism primarily. Um, but for the last maybe five to seven years, I've also been doing some ethnographic projects. And I'm especially interested in the ways in which contemporary communities interpret or interact with pre-modern texts and also, you know, a little bit more complicated to get at. I'm also really uh, become really interested in how um, our interactions with ethnographic communities, with contemporary communities, might, inter might affect the way that we actually read and interpret pre-modern texts. So kind of going both directions. I've become really interested in the ways in which um, how our, our experiences as teachers, our pedagogical kind of experiences can or should affect uh, our research in Buddhist studies. I'm Stephanie Baldwell, and I am an assistant professor of Chinese Buddhism at UCLA. I've just sort of made the transition to UCLA from the University of Winnipeg. So I've gone from a, a teaching heavy job to a kind of research heavy job and um, I've been reflecting on that a lot in my professional life. I work on medieval Chinese Buddhism. I'm interested in women in medieval China and I'm interested in how Buddhist texts provide us um, source materials for discovering more things about women in medieval China and women in, in sort of pre-modern times in general. I'm becoming more and more interested in how we use pre-modern texts uh, in the service of critical scholarship uh, and in the service of critical discussions across the humanities. I'm going to start first um, by pitching a question to Amy uh, and ask her what she thinks is her ideal of a Buddhist textual scholar or what she's been sort of, what's the ideal of a, a Buddhist scholar or a Buddhist textual scholar that has been kind of transmitted uh, down to her? I, I have thought about this a lot and um, it's affected the way that I presented myself and the way that I've, um, you know, um, shaped my scholarship. Um, although I think I'm starting to kind of have some more critical reflection on it and more agency about those questions. You know, there's this kind of image of the language jock, right? Who knows who's, who's like super virtuosic at languages and kind of has the chops, right? And I think that that's um, really valued and, and really respected. Now, I mean, I think, I think that that is val valuable and it should be respected. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, from the perspective of kind of the philological textual oriented center of our field, kind of other approaches are necessarily <laughs> respected. Like you, you know, I, I was kind of trained very classically in a number of Buddhist languages. Um, but I don't consider myself somebody who's very good at languages. I don't consider myself as somebody who has that great aptitude to read across language families. And it's always been uh, difficult for me. It still is difficult for me, um, but it's valuable. So I do it, right? But part of the, I think part of the frustration that many graduate students feel or people interested in doing graduate study in Buddhist studies feel is that they're going to have to do something for many years that makes them unhappy, which is like, you know, strenuous textual study. And maybe that's not what they need to be doing if you know if we kind of expand the way we train graduate students and it took me into basically until now to realize that I do have certain strengths in reading and using texts and and I am good at using some kinds of texts and reading uh, some kinds of texts critically um, but I'm not good at being you know the kind of traditional orientalist scholar who reads you know a ton of different languages and reconstructs words and that, that's not my aptitude nor is it particularly my interest. I really appreciate people who are doing you know critical editions or are doing like incredible spade work and that and you know really like can parse out um difficult passages or kind of follow a word and find you know what it actually means in that context versus other contexts and i you know i i i kind of know i'm enough of a language oriented person that i can kind of follow that scholarship and really appreciate it 
but you know, maybe I sort of see myself as someone kind of in the middle who's, who's kind of able to consume that scholarship or appreciate it, understand it, but then kind of do something else with it. Yeah. And so for me, from my point of view, that's great. That's great that there are people who have different skill sets and different, you know, abilities. How do you think that ideal is policed? How have you experienced that? I've heard it often said that, you know, we are Buddhist studies, so we make the rules, right? And if we want to change the rules, we just change the rules. Uh, and that's true to a certain extent, but I also feel it's very generational. Uh, and that change is not just always easily accepted. I think that I've been successful in my field so far. You know, I've, I've got the, my dream job. I, I'm proud of my publications. Um, but there was a time when I was considering leaving academia. Uh, so I had been invited to a workshop, um, a translation-based workshop. Um, and, you know, I was very junior in my field and came with a rough translation, um, assured that the goal of this workshop was to, to sort of work on translation and also talk about um, sort of social issues of text, which I'm far more interested in than textual minutia. As soon as I'm done speaking, um, a very senior person in the crowd who I'd never met before, uh, but is very, very senior, uh, and is not assigned to be the discussant for my paper or, or anything like that, um, stands up and, and hands out a retranslation of the text that I have just translated, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it's, I, I wasn't particularly good at translating this type of text at that particular time. And that's why I went to the workshop because I wanted help, right? That, that act of kind of handing out this retranslation effectively erased your entire presentation, your entire yeah. argument. And my presentation talked about the social lives of women because that's what I'm interested in. Um, and after the person had handed out the retranslation, there was no further discussion about the social lives of women. Um, during my presentation, or in fact, any of the other presentations, you know, it really set the tenor of the, um, or the tone of the workshop. Like this workshop is going to be about how do we translate things in a way that this person agrees with. And this person did subsequently, I watched, go around to all the other presenters and for them did the favor of doing it mm -hmm. uh, like at lunchtime or something. For me, it was, it was uh, in, in my face. Uh, and, and I was told by another person at the, at the workshop, at the end of the workshop, that he thought that that had only happened to me because I was junior and a woman. And so that was made explicit to me by somebody else that was at the workshop. So if it was clear to him, I expect that it was clear to other people. And it was a way of, I read it as a way of trying to, to bring me in line and say, if you're going to read this kind of material, if you're going to deal with this kind of material, these are the questions at stake. And it was also a kind of a, what we've talked about is kind of translation shaming. You know, this person saying, you're not good enough to deal with these sources. You're not good enough to have this conversation. Subsequently, it turns out that this person um, uh, was a peer reviewer for an article that I had in a journal, and I didn't know that at the time of the workshop. When I got the peer review back, uh, not only did the person reveal that this was not double blind, that the person had been at the workshop and had seen my translation of the workshop and sort of, you know, this person had been present at the most disastrous moment in my academic life and still was allowed to be the peer reviewer of this journal article. Yeah. Um, and then the person uh, basically said very, very um, personal things basically said that I wasn't as capable as his undergraduate students, you know, that I shouldn't be publishing in this journal. I shouldn't even think of publishing in this journal. Uh, and then the person accused me of plagiarism, of having plagiarized uh, his translation, his retranslation without citing it. And, you know, that I, I did adopt a change but I thought, you know, it's a workshop. We're here to discuss this kind of thing. And I certainly didn't like plagiarize word for word or anything like that. I, I adopted a, a yeah. changing subject, basically, is, is yeah. what it amounted to. So, yeah. So these kinds of these kinds of stories, I think, happen a lot, you know, where we want to take textual scholarship into a different place than it usually is. And, uh, and we're shamed and challenged for doing so. I mean, plagiarism is like the cardinal sin of scholarship. That's something you should not accuse someone of lightly, right? It was my first IABS, Inter International Association of Buddhist Studies Conference. I was absolutely, you know, intimidated. Um, I spent six months doing nothing but working on my IABS paper, nothing else. 
all new translations, um, um, just, I mean, it basically was a kind of two chapters of my dissertation worth of work. Um, and um, it was new work, it wasn't from my dissertation, but I mean, just to give you a sense of like how much effort and time I put into this. So, um, so I reached out to this scholar uh, who works in, was working on similar kind of material and um, asked for, you know, asked for um, some input on what I was working on. Um, he suggested that we exchange papers. We did exchange papers. Um, IAB's papers, he was also presenting at IAB's. Um, so we exchanged papers. And um, I would say within 24 hours of me sending him my paper, maybe less, I got this email back with a detailed list of um, um, all the places that according to him, I had not um, followed correct citation. Um, procedure that I had um, not cited his work sufficiently. And then he also suggested that I had not done my own translations based on, I don't know what, I don't know what evidence. I mean, um, and uh, I was devastated. <laughs> I was devastated. I mean, I, I was so um, destabilized by it, right? Um, because it ha it was my own work. I, I, there, there were a few kind of places where I should have cited something that I didn't, but I sort of, in my view, it was a rough draft. It wasn't something that, that, I, that I would publish. Um, and, you know, I, it was more of a kind of technical or sort of something I had to clean up, right? Not something that was, I wasn't sort of in any substantial way, like copying his work. And I certainly had done my own translations. So um, I was just I was just so devastated and also just shocked and appalled that um, that that was the level of collegiality that he had to offer, you know, yeah. to someone who was no threat at all. I was I had just gotten my PhD and you know it was kind of nowhere and going. Uh, you know, I just wasn't. Uh, There's was no way in which I was um, actually in any practical way threatening to him. Right. So. So we went to the conference and he sat front and center in exactly the middle of the auditorium <laughs> and I gave my paper and um, I was very careful to sort of very publicly cite his work and praise his work multiple times. And I, maybe that saved me from a kind of public humiliation the way you described. Um, so, but I did kind of watch that same scholar take down the other, only other young female scholar on the panel, take her down, just absolutely take her down. Um, and I don't, I don't have any interpretation of that, but you know, I, I, it, I, it did make me think, and it also made me think that could have so easily have been me. Um, yeah. So I, I interpreted that, um, it took me a while to get past that. Um, and when I did finally get past it, I only could really interpret that as uh, hazing, you know, as a kind of hazing. Sometimes I've experienced some pushback uh, when you, when talking about these kinds of issues as hazing or as sort of unnecessarily cruel ways of, of sort of shaming junior scholars. And the pushback often looks like, well, it's not hazing, it's rigor. You know, the most rigorous scholar is the one who can read the most languages and read them the best. And if you're not that scholar, then you should be disciplined by that scholar is kind of the idea behind it. So, you know, just as a basic principle, and I think I would say this to young scholars, especially coming up, that yes, critique is really healthy. You want critique, like you want people to be saying, this doesn't seem right, or did you try that? Or you need to look at this, right? But that's different than a kind of punching down, which is really more about reinforcing certain kinds of power. I went to a, a conference once uh, and the organizer of the conference at one point stood up uh, and made the statement to everyone present. He said, um, you'll notice that there are no methodological papers here. This incredibly smart woman who was a dear colleague was sitting next to me at this conference, also in the audience. And she just leaned over to me and she was like, there is a methodology here. The methodology is like philology. <laughs> it's, you know, 
critical historical reading of texts is what it is. Like that is a methodology. That's not a kind of clear lens through which you see all things in their true form. Uh, in fact, ignoring methodology is a lack of rigor. Translation is always interpretation. You know, you can read a text and, and this has happened to me many times where I've read a text sort of with one set of questions in mind and translated things one way and with another set of questions in mind and translated things another way. And I only see it when I look at subsequent versions on my own computer, right? <laughs> and see the differences. We have an obligation to think about what we're even doing with these texts. Uh, I think there is a kind of larger history of, uh, which involves things like colonialism <laughs> and you know, um, having indigenous experts that don't get mentioned. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things going on, you know, historically, politically in terms of power and the way that we interact with these texts and to not say anything about that uh, is incredibly naive and I would even say unethical. I mean, there are a lot of philologists who are making these points, you know, Sheldon Pollock is yeah. one of them. Um, but I think these, I think these, I think these kinds of questions can't be optional. They have to be necessary and required. You know, how do we train people? What does it mean when we say, oh, you know, they, their training is X, they have good training. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. We use that word all the time and I hate that word <laughs> because <laughs> it, to me it just reflects, and, and I've, I've said it myself, I've been trained this way, I've been trained that way, but training to me just reflects power and obedience. And, and that's actually what we're talking like about. A dog, you mean like training a dog? Like training a dog. Yeah. And so it's like, when you go through graduate school, you're trained and uh, you're trained to read texts often if you're in Buddhist studies, but you're also trained in sort of more pervasive, but less acknowledged ways. You're trained in the sorts of questions that are acceptable. I think I believe in the kind of shifts of language. So, you know, I would like to say something more like experience, you know, what's the experience you bring? What's the experience you've been offered through graduate study? Uh, what's the experience you've been offered outside of graduate study? And how does that experience shape you yeah. as a researcher? We're often taught or we think we should ignore our own experience and biases when we're like doing a research project, right? I think quite otherwise, and that we have to acknowledge who we are as people and bring that experience to our questions because only that's when we'll get new questions. You know, if we just keep being trained in the same old questions, how do we get new questions, right? And new questions are so important. A lot of times people will say things like, well, I don't think, you know, I don't think she had good training. I don't think she was <laughs> well, right? I think what that really is, is that's code for, um, she's not in a lineage that mm -hmm. affords her the automatic power and prestige, right? So there's, it's a kind of way of marking someone's unearned status, right? Like they're in that lineage, they were trained by that person. And so therefore we can invite that person into the club because we can invite that junior person into the club because the senior person is part of the club already. So that's one thing it makes me think of. Um, but the other thing that I, and I think this relates more to your, your point, the thing about the, that word training is that it kind of implies that you're trained and then it's done, right? You're <laughs> trained and it's closure. Yeah. So, you know, so I had, I had an interaction with a, a senior scholar <laughs> a couple of years ago who kind of like buttonholed me at a cocktail party at the end of a very nice conference it was a social gathering. There was, you know, was absolutely no need for this to come up, but, and started like absolutely trashing my dissertation, which admittedly my dissertation is extremely flawed. I am the first one to admit that, um, but I then, you know, revised it absolutely from the ground up and did tons of new work and published a book, you know, eight years later, which has gotten, you know, which was critically acclaimed by the AR. And I was like, okay, so you're going to talk about my flawed dissertation instead of my 2017 book that is, I'm very proud of. I think it's an excellent book. Other people have also thought that, you know, not to to my own horn, but, you know, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like we need to allow each other to 
we need to recognize that we are all in process as scholars. And again, now it goes back to my point about critique, right? That critique's fantastic, but like just simply punching down for the sake of a power play and putting someone in their place is not productive. And that's all that was. It does you know, this is, I think this also goes along with sort of best practices or, or etiquette in the field, which also goes along with citation practices, with, which people like Natasha Heller have talked yeah. about, um, and we've talked about, you know, what do you cite of a scholar, right? <laughs> you don't cite their dissertation. You look and see if they've published something else subsequent to that dissertation and do them the favor. You know, dissertations are places, I think anyways, where we can come up with new ideas and explore new ways of seeing and put out new sources and, and do groundbreaking things. But uh, that's where they stop, in my opinion. They need more work, you know, they need polish. Let's talk a bit about what kinds of things we could do to address some of these issues and problems that we've been talking about, or, you know, some of these experiences we've had. It seems so easy, uh, but apparently it's not, which is to stop platforming jerks. If they're a known jerk, if they're a known, if they're a known nasty person, it, you know, if they, if they make a habit of kind of harassing people and, and being territorial and being negative, just don't invite them. You know, it doesn't matter to me how senior they are. It doesn't matter to me how much they might know about a topic. If they're not willing to disseminate that knowledge in a way that's helpful uh, to people who are new in the field, they just shouldn't be given a platform. But being mindful of, you know, equity issues as opposed to equality, right? Equity issues. So trying to make it possible for people who either are junior scholars or postdocs or, you know, don't have, um, or maybe, you know, advanced graduate students, you know, finding ways to make it financially possible for them to attend events, you know, kind of putting some effort into that, make, being intentional about that. Not everyone has the same level of research funding. Not everyone has the same level of visibility because of that. Despite, you know, the general decline in the humanities, Buddhist studies has grown um, lately. You know, there's more scholars, there's all of these centers for Buddhist studies uh, in universities are being created in the last 10 years. Um, we've grown in numbers, we've grown in topics, uh, we've grown in diversity, and, and that's super. And I think what needs to happen is, is a change now in how we, how we make research um, communities. I think, you know, before there was just a few places training uh, graduate students, so people were tight knit. And, you know, it was enough to simply call your friends and be like, <laughs> you know, let's, let's do this project. Who can you invite? Who can you invite? You know, and now I think we have to be much more strategic. And instead of just calling our friends, um, you know, look for meaningful research projects mm -hmm. and then find people that, you know, the field is so diverse now and, and look for people uh, in other countries, look for people in contingent positions. Yeah who are doing this work and bring them to the table. And just given the kind of state of higher education, the ways, you know, the kind of rhetoric out there against experts and the, yeah. the way that the humanities have been devalued, I think it's also really, you know, very positive for people in Buddhist studies and beyond, right? To, to be more kind of aware of producing public facing scholarship. Expanding the kind of media that we use to get our scholarship out there uh, we also get to ask different questions and engage different audiences in ways that are just good for the field. Doing peer reviewed research, doing that level of research is so important because I think it gives us, um, expertise gives us academic freedom. I think it's something we have to be responsible with. Um, you know, if I'm going to say something in a broad audience, I want to know that I'm right. You know, I want to know that there's consensus around what it is that I'm saying. But yeah, translating that kind of rigorous peer-reviewed research to new audiences has the other effect of making us think differently about the material and the ways that we present it and who our audiences are. And then we come back again to our research with different questions. So there really is a back and forth. You know, and, and as someone who consumes these days with, with some of the projects that I'm on, a lot of kind of public writing on Buddhism you know, it only makes me appreciate more the kind of, okay, I'll use the word rigor, the rigor <laughs> that, that <laughs> scholars is kind of our bread and butter. It's what we expect of ourselves and each other, really. Yeah. Um, because it, it really, um, it's, I think it's very healthy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it, it creates knowledge which has the potential to make the world better instead of worse.
I wonder to kind of round out this conversation, if there's something we want to say to uh, graduate students who are watching this video or early career scholars, postdocs, people who haven't uh, found a job or contingent faculty or distinguish as best you can between punching down and critique. Mm -hmm. Don't mistake one for the other. Try to disambiguate that, you know, take critique for what it's worth. But if someone's just being mean, you know, name that, get away from that person. I, in my case, my doctoral committee were all wonderful people and I, I didn't feel that I was being punched down at. However, I, I've heard that from many people. Uh, and one way to kind of skirt that is to have alternate communities um, that will platform your work and will allow you to be an expert and will allow you a different kind of voice. Just expand, expand, expand your scope as wide as possible and meet Absolutely. people. Yeah, I guess I would just add collaboration, not competition. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's it's really maybe um, tempting to see competition as necessary as kind of well, that's reality. That's how things really you need to compete. Okay, yeah, I mean, you do need to compete, I suppose, but I do think that um, collaboration is also a way of kind of getting ahead. It always has yeah. been for me. Yeah. Um, so, and it's um, one that will make your work life less lonely and alienated. And <laughs>